Can you hear me? You could hear me because I'm very loud. <laughs> so we didn't get any of that on tape, did we? <laughs> yeah, I had a malfunction with my mic this morning. I think it's broken now. All right. I'm not going to tell that whole story again. <laughs> real church, real people. And I hate preaching with these. I like to wave my hands around a lot. So this is going to have a dramatic effect on the rest of the message. <laughs> All right, we roll with it. We'll have to do that one another time. All right, so we're going to talk about <laughs> First Chronicles. So last week we heard from Keith Patman, Wycliffe, Wycliffe Bible Translators. Really interesting. You can go back and watch the Bible study online. And just a note to the sound people, yes, we are streaming live. It's probably me, Dustin. I almost ripped the mic off my head today, so I had a little incident this morning where these wires caught on a door handle. <laughs> it was not fun. All right, so we're rolling with it. The week before that, we were continuing in our series, The Rest of the Story. If you're new, this is where we're looking you know, the entire Bible, the whole thing, all the accounts that a lot of people normally leave out. If you've been in church for a long time, you might have done a series called The Story. And if you did and you thought you went through the whole Bible, you didn't. <laughs> they leave a lot out. So we're looking at all of that stuff, the whole thing. And we're seeing that it's important and it all kind of connects here. So last week, well not last week, the week before last week, we saw the account of David's census. His pride had caused him to take a census, unnecessarily so. He was boasting about his own achievements instead of boasting about the Lord. The other thing that we saw is that some of these accounts run parallel. There's 66 books in the Protestant canon of the Bible, more in other denominations. We can get to that at Bible study. But some of them recall the same accounts as others, but they're not always in chronological order. The Bible does not work that way. So it gets really confusing. And what I'm trying to do is put this kind of back together for you. So I made a chart last week, and some people said it was helpful. So I made another chart. I don't have the mic in my hand in that picture. <laughs> so this is kind of how it works. First Chronicles comes later. First Kings is before that. So you kind of got to jump around. And we can see here there's a big whole bunch of chapters that come before. They're actually happening before First Kings. But in the Bible, they're after. And this is why it can be very, very confusing. So I'm going to try to put this together for you. And hopefully, it'll make a little bit more sense. So, two weeks ago, David's punishment for his pride was the plague. There was a plague. And we saw that the death angel was over Aruna the Jebusite's threshing floor. If you don't know what a threshing floor is, I'm not going to explain it again this week. I did it already last week. So, <laughs> that's a theme today. I'm not repeating myself. So, death angel's there. God says, stop. That's enough. That site will become the site of the temple. And that's where we are at today. So we'll hop right into 1 Chronicles 22, starting at verse 1. Then David said, This will be the location of the temple of the Lord God and the place of the altar for Israel's burnt offerings. So David gave orders to call together the foreigners living in Israel, and he assigned them the task of preparing finished stone for the building of the temple of God. David provided large amounts of iron for the nails that would be needed for the doors and the gates and for the clamps. And he gave more bronze than could be weighed. He also provided innumerable cedar logs for the men of Tyre and Sidon had brought vast amounts of cedar to David. David said, my son Solomon is still young and inexperienced, and since the temple to be built for the Lord must be a magnificent structure, famous and glorious throughout the world, I will begin making preparations for it now. So David collected vast amounts of building material before his death. Then David sent for his son Solomon and instructed him to build the temple for the Lord, the God of Israel. Separated this out, because I want you to see a key verse. 1 Chronicles 22.7, my son, he's talking to Solomon, I wanted 
to build a temple to honor the name of the Lord my God, David told him. But the Lord said to me, you have killed many men in battles you have fought, and since you have shed so much blood in my sight, you will not be the one to build a temple to honor my name. Key verse. I wanted to build the temple, but the Lord said no. So this is another form of discipline over David for some of the things that he has done. Now, I'm going to summarize a little. We'll get that chart back up. Yep. If we continue in 1 Chronicles, this can be a little monotonous for people because it's a lot of names of different people and all kinds of different things. So I'm going to summarize that for you. There's another place in the Bible, like Numbers, where people sometimes quit. They give up. <laughs> so chapter 23, we have the duties of the Levites. The Levites are like temple servants. There's a lot of them, 38,000 of them. The duties of the priests in 24, they rotate. So it talks about the rotations. Chapter 25, duties of the musicians. Of note, Asaph. Nobody talks about Asaph. But Asaph writes quite a few psalms. I think 11 of the psalms he writes. So nobody reads those little like introductory things above the psalm. They leave that out. But it gives you important information, including when they're being written and what they're being written about. Chapter 26, gatekeepers and other officials. Chapter 27, Israel's military. Of note, Benaiah, he's going to be important as we continue in the rest of the story, stuff that people don't normally hear anything about. When we get to chapter 28, we see David's charge to Israel and the affirmation of Solomon. First Chronicles 28, starting at verse 1, David summoned all the officials of Israel to Jerusalem the leaders of the tribes, the commanders of the army divisions, the other generals and captains, the overseers of the royal property and livestock, the palace officials, the mighty men, and all the other brave warriors in the kingdom. A lot of people, keep that in mind. David rose to his feet and said, my brothers and my people, it was my desire to build a temple where the ark of the Lord's covenant, God's footstool, could rest permanently. I made the necessary preparations for building it but God said to me, you must not build a temple to honor my name, for you are a warrior and have shed much blood. So we're getting redundant here. Yet the Lord, the God of Israel, has chosen me from all my father's family to be king over Israel forever. For he has chosen the tribe of Judah to rule, and from among the families of Judah, he chose my father's family. And from among my father's sons, the Lord was pleased to make me king over all Israel. And from among my sons, for the Lord has given me many, he has chosen Solomon to succeed me on the throne of Israel and to rule over the Lord's kingdom. He said to me, your son Solomon will build my temple and its courtyards, for I have chosen him as my son, and I will be his father. And if he continues to obey my commands and regulations as he does now, I will make his kingdom last forever. If we continue in chapter 28, we see a pattern for the temple. David says it was given to him by the hand of the Lord. Offerings for the temple. Of note, it's kind of interesting. It's a lot of money. <laughs> There's, it is a big, big building project. So what I did was I took all the tons of gold. I want to know how much it would be worth, and I put it in like a calculator. And if it's reliable, it's $15 billion, $600 million. $15 billion. It's a big project, very, very expensive. So this is just huge to give you the gravity and probably why so many chapters of the Bible are dedicated to all the different details. If we continue, we have David's prayer of thanks for the, table, uh, for the temple and then the death of David. But wait, <laughs> we have to go to 1 Kings, and that is why we're inserting that in between the death of David and these preparations and proclamation. And it becomes really important. It's a, it's a reason why you really need to read both of the accounts at the same time. Because you get a little bit of extra information and other things make sense. If you just started at 1 Kings and you read this account about what David's son Adonijah does, it might not have the same gravity as it would if you read 1 Chronicles first. So keep in mind what David did, all the different things that he said and who he's talking to. So we're going to hop over to 1 Kings. 1 Kings 1.1. 1, 1. 
King David was now very old, and no matter how many blankets covered him, he could not keep warm. So his advisors told him, let's find a young virgin to wait on you and look after you, my lord. She will lie in your arms and keep you warm. So they searched throughout the land of Israel for a beautiful girl, and they found Abishag from Shunem and brought her to the king. The girl was very beautiful, and she looked after the king and took care of him. But the king had no sexual relations with her. We've talked about this in the series. Polygamy was a thing back then. We just got to deal with it. So you have wives, primary wives. You also have concubines. They're kind of like secondary wives. Keep this girl in mind. Now it's important to explain David's sons. Because here's what's going to happen here. Another power struggle. He has a son, Amnon. Amnon, he... Kids in the room, well... Raped Tamar, his daughter. Not good. His son Absalom kills him in revenge for it. Then Absalom stages a rebellion. And then Joab, David's general, kills him. So David's already lost two of his sons. There's another son in the middle nobody talks about, but we really don't know much about him. Daniel, perhaps. Anyway, if we keep moving along, the next one in line in succession to the throne is Adonijah. You have to keep this in mind. So enter Adonijah into the scene. And here's what happens. 1 Kings 1.5. About that time, David's son Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith, began boasting, I will make myself king. So he provided himself with chariots and charioteers and recruited 50 men to run in front of him. Now his father, King David, had never disciplined him at any time, even asking, why are you doing that? Adonijah had been born next after Absalom, and he was very handsome. So now we have another rebellion being staged. And it gets really bad because there's a split between his leadership, his generals, his prophets or priests. Very bad. So he gets, this time, Joab to side with him. This is David's general. He's up to no good a lot, but he's never done this before. So Adonijah gets Joab to side with him and Abiathar. Abiathar is the priest he rescued from Doeg the Edomite when he killed all the priests. So he should be grateful. And so should Joab. They should both be dead. Well, they go with his son, Adonijah. Again, really tragic and sad. But there's another priest, Zadok, we learned about him. Doesn't agree. Neither does the prophet Nathan. They stay on David's side. So here's what happens. Nathan approaches Bathsheba. She's the one that David had the affair with. Nathan's the prophet who rebuked him after they did it. Going on, Adonijah has staged a rebellion. Now, she's not Adonijah's mom. Different mom. You better take care of this. You better go talk to David. David doesn't know. If you value your life and your son's life, you're going to approach David about this. This is a big deal. So here's what you do. You go and tell him, remind him of the vow, his responsibilities, and then I'll come in at a key time and validate it. And so that's what happens. So she very formally goes before David, says, remember the vow. When you die, if Adonijah takes over, we're going to be treated as criminals. Nathan comes in, validates the account, and he says, okay, make Solomon king. Fantastic. So they do just that. Nathan the prophet, also important figure, again, Benaiah, he's guarding them as they go down. They anoint Solomon king along with Zadok. They blow the ram's horn, proclaim his kingship. Now, we have the other camp involved, they're feasting and partying, celebrating Adonijah's kingship. They made him king too at the same time. Well, they hear all the celebrating. In fact, they arrive back at Jerusalem and there's this great procession and it's so loud that they say it makes the earth shake. Well, Joab, remember the general, he's the traitor now, hears it and he goes, what's that noise? At the same time, in comes Jonathan, Abiathar's son. Well, Adonijah's like, well, you're a good man. You must have good news. Nope, not at all. They made Solomon king. So they 
Everybody kind of scatters and they run away. And so Adonijah does something funny. I'll take the time to explain it to you. He grabs the horns of the altar. It's kind of a strange thing. So they don't have the temple yet. It's the tabernacle, the tent. The altar's in there. He grabs the horns. Why? You're begging for mercy when you do that. You're grabbing the horns of the altar. So this is what he does. Solomon finds out, but he forgives him. He sends for him, forgives him, but with a warning. If he makes trouble, I'm going to kill him. But if he doesn't, I won't touch a hair on his head. All good. So now, if we turn the page, we get to 1 Kings 2. And it says this, At the time of King David's, As the time of King David's death approached, he gave this charge to his son Solomon. I am going where everyone on earth must someday go. Take courage and be a man. Observe the decrees, commands, regulation, and laws written in the law of Moses so that you will be successful in all you do and wherever you go. If you do this, then the Lord will keep the promise he made to me. He told me, if, key word, if your descendants live as they should and follow me faithfully with all their heart and soul, one of them will always sit on the throne of Israel. And there's something else. Joab, that general, remember, he killed my other generals, Amasa and Abner. Yeah, he stained his sandals with their blood. It was murder. He claimed it was in wartime, but no, it's murder. So don't, Solomon, let him go to the grave in peace. Remember, Barzillai, now you may not remember when David had to retreat, when Absalom rebelled. And he goes even further into the forest in Manam. Barzillai was kind to him. He's the older man. Well, he's probably passed away now. But repay his sons with kindness. He gives this instruction. Oh, yeah. Remember also during that time when I had to flee from my son Absalom. Remember Shimei? He was the guy cursing me and throwing rocks. You're a wise man. You'll know how to arrange a bloody death for him. So this is all kind of David's deathbed instructions to Solomon. Now, 1 Chronicles and 1 Kings for a moment will run back into parallel. We see the death of David, 1 Kings 2.10. Then David died and was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. David had reigned over Israel for 40 years, seven of them in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. Solomon became king and sat on the throne of David, his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. First Chronicles, if we're doing it in parallel, gives us a little more. First Chronicles 29, 29, all the events of King David's reign from the beginning to the end are written in the record of Samuel the seer, the record of Nathan the prophet, and the record of Gad the seer. These accounts include the mighty deeds of his reign and everything that happened to him and to Israel and to all the surrounding kingdoms. We've run into this before. Again, it's another area where we see books they're referencing that we don't have. We just got to deal with it. They are dust now. Nobody has them. We might also put, as a side note, 2 Samuel 23 in here, the last words of David. I know I was talking to my wife about it. She says, I was reading through, and it's weird. You get chapter 23 of 2 Samuel, and you have the last words of David, and then he goes and takes the census. Is he doing that from the grave? No. Again, it's another example of the Bible not being in chronological order. It'll just recount certain things. Well, now, David's dead, and Adonijah is still vying for the throne. Remember, Solomon's forgiven him, but he's still going at it. So he approaches his mom, Bathsheba. She's suspicious at first. Whoa, do you come here with good intentions? She knows what he's up to. He's no good. He says, yeah, but you know that all Israel wanted me to be king, right? But the Lord <laughs> made Solomon king, right? So here's what I'm asking you do for me. Remember Abishag? Tell Solomon to give her to me as a wife. Solomon does not react kindly to this. At first, he's very polite to his mom. In fact, he gets her another throne when she comes in. Very respectful to his mom. 
Some denominations see this as a prefigure of Mary and Jesus because they're both sitting on thrones when they have the conversation to put the picture in your mind. Very majestic thing. It's like a high court type of situation. But Solomon loses it. He says, "Uh uh-uh. Adonijah has sealed his fate with this request. He's done. He mentions Joab and Abiathar. They're still alive. So he's still got them on their side. This is very dangerous. Now, again, it wasn't his dad's wife, per se, but it's a concubine. It's something close, and it would put him in line to the throne, probably. So Solomon, no, I'm going to have him killed. So now you got to remember, Benaiah comes back in the picture. He's now the new general and Solomon's henchman, so to speak. So Adonijah gets killed. Benaiah kills him. Adonijah dies. Now he's going to clean house. He's going to secure his kingdom. Grabs the horns of the altar. He knows he's next. He's probably going to die. So he stays there in the tent. Benaiah's like, come on out. I got to kill you. No. <laughs> I'm going to stay here and just hold the horns of the altar. Right? He goes back and woman. No, he's holding the horns of the altar. He goes, fine. Kill him there. And so he kills him at the altar of the Lord. Sounds bloody, but... Joab kind of deserves it in this case. <laughs> then there's Shimei, the guy who threw the rocks and cursed David. He brings him in. He's actually kind of merciful to him, but there's something going on here. Well, Solomon's quite wise. So he says, listen, he puts him on like kind of a house arrest. Build a house for yourself here in Jerusalem and stay in the city. If you do, you won't get yourself killed. If you leave, you die. Goes fine at first, but then three years later, he loses a couple of runaway slaves. He goes after them. Solomon finds out. He brings Shimei back in and says, yo, what's the deal? And then has Benaiah kill him as well. It says, so now the kingdom was firmly in Solomon's grip. What David did had a ripple effect. David accomplished a lot. There were some things he did right, some things he did wrong. And God disciplined him. David wanted, he wanted to build the temple, but he shed too much blood. God disciplined him for the affair with Bathsheba, Uriah's murder. They lost a child. The plague for his pride were taking the temple away. We saw that there were some things that David did that Solomon had to clean up, and some things that David did not do that Solomon had to clean up. What David failed to do was pass that discipline on to Adonijah. Again, another key verse, 1 Kings 1, 5. About that time, David's son Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith, began boasting, I will make myself king. So he provided himself with chariots and charioteers and recruited 50 men to run in front of him. Now his father, King David, had never disciplined him at any time, even by asking, why are you doing that? Here's what the Bible says about disciplining our children. Proverbs 13, 24. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. Those are some strong words, aren't they? Hate their children. Proverbs 23, 13, and 14. Don't fail to discipline your children. The rod of punishment won't kill them. Physical discipline may well save them from death. Proverbs 19, 18. Discipline your children while there is hope. Otherwise, you will ruin their lives. Did you catch that? You will ruin their lives. There is modern parenting, and then there is biblical parenting. They're different, aren't they? Now, I want to make a little disclaimer here about the rod. <laughs> because, because, what kind of rod, Pastor Gene? So, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Um, there are a few steps before the rod that if you get right, you really don't have to use it very much, at least in my experience. And I will say this, I do not advocate for physical abuse in any way, shape, or form. I had the rod used against me, or a metal spatula, <laughs> or other tools <laughs> used against me, a spoon, let's make a list. Okay, this is not like counseling for, anyway. <laughs> a lot of different belts and stuff, anyway. Too much, it was a little too much, if we're being honest, right? I'm over it, don't worry, I'm fine. Um, but I have to say, a little healthy fear helped. Sometimes a little spanking was kind of helpful, just saying, and the Bible allows for it. So I don't think that the rod of discipline is like, you know, four, 39 lashes, you know, or something like that. No, but the spanking was healthy. But let me just take you back a step. There are a couple of things that I think are helpful, that if you as a parent get them right, you may never have to use the rod. The first one we're going to talk about, maybe in a couple of weeks, is going to be fear. We're going to learn something about fear. We're going to learn about what the Bible says about fear. Just like parenting, it's quite different. It's going to shock some of you, what the Bible says about fear. The Bible says we should have fear, including fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of all wisdom. Fear of the Lord. You know what else it says? The wise fear. It says cautious in your Bible in the Proverbs. Fear in the originals. It says fear. It says we should fear the king, authorities. And I think you can translate that into parents. A little healthy fear of my dad. Loved him, but feared him. Here's the other thing, especially as it relates to Adonijah. We cannot give our kids whatever they want, or whatever they ask for. You see a lot of that, right? They cry, we give them whatever they want. Here's the thing. That whole thing starts in infancy. That's where that starts. We become who we are very early on, and it's very hard to change it once we develop. Very young, our parents teach us to be who we become. And so, my mom gave me this advice when we were, I was not pregnant. I hate when people say that. We're pregnant. No, you're not. And the guy said, you know, that's, you, don't, you did all the work in the fun part, and now the woman has to pay for it. So anyway, we're, we're pregnant. Stop it. It's like the we people with the teams. I know I'll offend a whole bunch of people. We won. You did not play the game. You can't even run. Like, anyway, I, this is good. <laughs> Uh, anyway, <laughs> but it's the same thing, right? We were pregnant, not pregnant. <laughs> but when she was pregnant and I got her pregnant, my parents were old school and they gave me some advice. They said, look, for your sanity's sake, it was like this rice formula stuff, looked like fish food. Give the baby that before bed. And then if she cries, check things. Right? Have you fed the baby? Do you need to change a diaper? Right? Does it have a temperature? Is it sick? Burp it. I am very good at burping babies because I love sleep. <laughs> so do that. If all the boxes get checked off, let the baby cry it out. And yes, there are a lot of experienced parents here. Uh-huh. Let the baby cry it out. Because you see, we are a bunch of liars. <laughs> what? We're a bunch of liars. When you got dressed up today, right, and someone says, how you doing? You're like, great, you lied. So you're liars, right? We pretend. We get dressed up fancy and stuff, but it's, it's a mask. But we lie from the beginning. We're wired that way. So what is the baby trying to do to manipulate you? Right? If I cry, they give me what I want. If I cry, and if you don't snuff that out in the beginning, you will make a monster. I see a lot of older people nodding their head. But 
modern parenting tells us something different. Have you noticed that? And here's an irony. This is just crazy to me. A lot of these modern parents, right, that subscribe to all these theories, people calling themselves doctors that are not doctors, and they do whatever they say, there's an irony here that makes me laugh. And I have to, like, hold my fingers back from the keyboard when I see it sometimes. They will make fun of other people, calling them names like snowflakes. They'll make fun of them while at the same time creating them. Did you notice that? It's weird. Modern parenting makes monsters. The success of our society requires discipline. And if we really love our children, we will discipline them. I am my daughter's father, not her friend. I always turn the mic off and walk away. <laughs> that was a good image. So likewise, if we scale this out, this is how God disciplines us, right? So now the parents are like, uh-oh, it's about me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you have to deal with the discipline now, at any age, no matter how old you are. It's not over. God disciplines us the same way and for the same reason, because he loves us. It's a good ringer. Proverbs 3.11, my child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Let that soak in. Likewise, he's doing it to us. If we look to the best commentary on these verses that we have, the best commentary on these Old Testament verses is the New Testament. We see what it says regarding godly discipline. The letter to the Hebrews. These are people who are suffering persecution. It says that in chapter 10. Let's us know. Because they're, they're Jewish people. They've converted to Christianity. And they're being persecuted for it. And so this author's point, this is what Hebrews is all about, is to give them encouragement. And what he's doing is, he's talking about a lot of Old Testament things and saying how Jesus is superior to all of those things. As great as that was, Jesus is superior. Chapter 11, he talks about people of faith. It's the faith chapter. And after that, chapter 12, remember there's no chapters in the original, he continues talking and he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. How? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he has seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as a child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child? who is never disciplined by its father. If God doesn't discipline you, as he does all his children, it means that you are illegitimate and not really his child at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us, so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. 
Now, a little tangential thing. If you're pretty observant, you probably noticed where the proverb was quoted. But if you're really, really observant, you probably noticed that it wasn't the same. It was a little different. And so it's an interesting note here. We've been talking about this a lot at Bible study. If you've ever noticed this, you read the New Testament and then you go back to the Old Testament and the verse they're quoting is not the same. 33%-ish of the New Testament is Old Testament quotations. A good Bible will point that out. The reason it's different is because they're not quoting the Hebrew version that we, I think, mistakenly base a lot of Bibles on. Some people are getting it nowadays. They will make a note of it, LXX, in your Old Testament. When you see that in the bottom, they're saying, oh, we had to go to the Greek, Greek version to get that prophecy or that thing. That's because the apostles are reading the Greek version, not the Hebrew version. And this is pretty remarkable because it's the letter to the Hebrews. And they're using the Greek version. So, good case for the Septuagint. If you have questions about that, I'll answer them for you. You can email me. Sometimes it seems like God is throwing rocks at us. Sometimes it seems like maybe he's letting someone throw rocks at us. But remember what David said when Shimei was throwing rocks at him. The Lord told him to do it. Perhaps he'll bless me for this. It's about attitude and perspective, seeing it the right way. We often don't understand because we don't have the right perspective. Like the old man throwing the rocks. From our perspective, it may look like God is trying to harm us, but from his perspective, these rocks, are just creating ripples leading us back to him. Ripples of discipline. These ripples in the water, the rocking of the boat, what seems very difficult is for our good. The letter to the Romans. If we get to chapter 8, Paul's talking about a new life in the spirit and also suffering for the faith like the Hebrews were. He says this, Romans 8, 18. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. If we keep reading. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. We don't always understand. And as I've said in the past, we can ask why. But we don't always get an answer right away. So we have to lean on the truth of God's word in these times of distress, trial, and suffering for our encouragement and for our hope. We must trust that if we are his children, that he's working everything out for our good. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this church, and by church I mean the people in it, your body, the body of Christ. Encourage them and build them up as they go through trials. Help them to know that they don't always have to understand but they have to know that you love them. And so, Lord, I pray that they'll remember where to place their hope in your eternal blessing, in your truth, in the word, in the promises that lie there within, not in the opinions of the world. Be with us. Unite us in your spirit and your love as we go out this week so that we can be vehicles of that love, of that hope to the world around us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you.